on World News Tonight. External Influence A Chinese envoy urges external countries to stop the impending political settlement of Syrian issue. What does this mean for Syria? Find out tonight. Failed launch The DPRK launches their military satellite a day after they announce the launch unsuccessfully, prompting the West and neighbours to scramble defence. Canada ablaze Wildfires spread across Canada, namely in Alberta and Nova Scotia, prompting hundreds of thousands to evacuate. Cuteness Overload Baby animals born on Mother's Day provide cuteness overload at Peru Zoo. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening, you are watching World News as we bring to you news from across the globe. Tonight we explore stories ranging from international disarray to wildfires to morbid warnings of humanity's fate. We start off with China's demands. A Chinese envoy called on external countries to stop obstructing dialogue and reconciliation among countries in the Middle East and promote the political settlement of the Syrian issue. Countries outside the region should fully respect the will of countries and people in the Middle East, said Zheng Zhuan, Deputy Permanent Representative of China to the United Nations at a Security Council meeting. As Arab countries' true friend, China welcomes and congratulates on Syria's recent return to the League of Arab States after 12 years of suspension. Zheng said, stressing that it provides new impetus for Arab countries to seek strength to solidarity and offers a new opportunity for the political settlement of the Syrian issue. China hopes all parties involved to seize this opportunity and enhance dialogue to make progress in politically settling the Syrian issue at an early date. Zheng urged Israel to immediately stop its attacks on civil facilities in Syria, including airports. He also called for giving priorities to energy at the early stage of the reconstruction in Syria as it bottlenecks humanitarian aid and the economic recovery in the country. The explosive remnants of of war are constantly causing casualties among Syrian civilians, so this issue should be included in the agenda of reconstruction as soon as possible, said Zheng. Noting that illegal unilateral sanctions severed impede the economic recovery and the improvement of people's livelihoods in Syria, he said all of them must be immediately and unconditionally lifted. The UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women released a report which pointed out that North Korean women who deflect to China face being trafficked and forced into marriage. The United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women released a report on Tuesday after a review of women's rights in China. The report pointed out the human rights violations that North Korean women refugees face, including human trafficking and forced marriages. The UN organization called on China to not repatriate any North Korean refugees who defect from the North, as North Korean women are being deprived of their rights to give birth because children born in China cannot register their birth locally without exposing the mother to the risk of being deported to North Korea. It also called for North Korean women and girls who have been victims of human trafficking to be given basic social services, such as temporary residence permits, medical and education services, alternative income opportunities and rehabilitation programs without being punished for violating immigration laws. In response to the report, China did not acknowledge the issue of human rights violations, stating that most of the North Korean women who come to China come to make money and it's difficult to consider that as human trafficking. The United Nations defines human trafficking as not only the buying and selling of people as goods, but also the act of taking people under the pretext of employment and preventing them from moving freely by exploiting their vulnerable position. The latest CEDAW report marks the first time the UN organization publicized the human rights issue of North Korean refugee women through a human rights review targeting China and not North Korea. Still in Northeast Asia, North Korea's attempt to put the country's first spy satellite into space failed in a setback to leader Kim Jong-un's push to boost his military capabilities as tensions with the United States and South Korea rise. North Korea launched a rocket carrying a satellite on Wednesday, according to South Korean military sources. Our military detected what North Korea claimed to be a space launch vehicle traveling in a southward direction from the area of Dongchang-ri in North Pyongyang province at around 6.29 a.m. 
the launch, North Korea's seventh attempt at launching a satellite, but the first in over seven years, has escalated regional tensions. Military analysis says the rocket fell into the West Sea around 200 kilometers west of South Korea's Ocheongdo Island. Military authorities on Wednesday morning said they are currently recovering what appears to be debris from the West Sea for further examination. However, according to North Korean state media, the Korean Central News Agency, the rocket launch was a failure. It reported that the projectile dropped into the West Sea after losing momentum due to an abnormal flight. The Bosch launch did rattle South Korea, however. On Pengyongdo Island, an island off South Korea's west coast and located below the rocket's flight path, residents were quickly ushered into shelters as public speakers blasted out warnings for a solid 20 minutes. The launch also prompted officials to send emergency evacuation messages through text and public speakers all over the capital city's Seoul, as they initially thought that debris may fall from the sky. The government has since withdrawn the warning, assuring citizens that the failed rocket launch does not pose a risk. North Korea had previously notified the International Maritime Organization of its intent to launch the reconnaissance satellite between May 31st and June 11th, adhering to their schedule with this recent launch. The KCNA said that North Korea is currently analyzing what went wrong and would launch another rocket in the near future. The situation triggered an emergency meeting of the National Security Council's Standing Committee, led by National Security Advisor Cho Tae-yong, to address North Korea's long-range ballistic missile launch under the pretext of a so-called satellite, as stated in an official release. The National Security Council has decried the rocket launch as a severe breach of UN Security Council resolutions and a potent provocation that threatens peace not only on the Korean Peninsula, but also potentially extending to a wider region. These comments were echoed by the presidential office in an official statement issued on Wednesday. Now, over in Africa, the conflict in Sudan is set to becoming one of the biggest humanitarian crises in the history of humanity. But this does not end in just Sudan. What does it mean for her neighbors and especially Shad? Take a look. There used to only be one family in Fanahamit's compound near Chad's border with Sudan. Now, there are 11. The dozens of arrivals are her relatives. And among 90,000 people who've escaped to Chad since fighting broke out in Sudan in mid-April. When a loved one needs assistance during this difficult time, we can't abandon them. That's why we try to share everything with them. Even the refugees who have set up shelters near our concession come to us to fetch water because they can't afford to buy it. Today, the women at the home in Kufrun sell roasted crickets as they struggle to get by. Hamit has been forced to make careful economies. But it's not just her household that has been stretched. Her country, Chad, one of the world's poorest, was already hosting 600,000 refugees from its war-torn neighbors. It's also grappling with a fourth consecutive year of food shortages. Overall, around 2.3 million people are in urgent need of food aid, the World Food Programme warned earlier in May. The UN's Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs has praised the extraordinary hospitality of the Chadian government and its people, but said the scale of the crisis requires more funding in order to save lives. The sudden influx of people has distorted the market for goods. Hamid says sugar has doubled in price and that the cost of grains and peanuts is high. Tensions have also risen over water. Some refugees at a camp south of Kufrun say they've been blocked by locals from drawing water at a communal well in a nearby village. Instead forced to dig their own wells in dry riverbeds. A state of emergency is in place in Canada as wildfires ravage thousands of acres across Nova Scotia. Officials say the area has already seen more blazes in 2023 than all of last year. Tonight, firefighters in Nova Scotia, Canada, battling a raging wildfire that has forced more than 16,000 people to evacuate along routes like this. 
This dashboard cam video showing extreme lack of visibility, sparks flying and forests burning all around the road, almost causing a crash. Government officials saying nearly 2,000 acres have been affected so far in the Halifax region alone and declaring a state of emergency. Hotspots and areas of open flame have been extinguished, but fire officials say reburn is still a dangerous possibility. Those fuels that are left from the original uh, time when the fire passed through are now 100% cured and they are ready to burn. The wildfire causing a massive smoke cloud to form over the port city. Smoke impacting air quality south of the border too, as far away as Connecticut. Folks who are vulnerable or may have respiratory disease uh, have to be very, very careful. As of Monday, 200 firefighters have been working to put the fire out in the Halifax region, but officials say resources have been spread thinner due to other outbursts across Canada, like the massive Barrington Lake fire just a few hours south and the Bocabec fire in New Brunswick. There is a shortage of firefighters. Um, this is a bad fire season, not only for Nova Scotia, but for Canada in general. The massive blazes out east coming as western and central Canada have also reeled with hellish fires since early May. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau calling the the wildfire situation in Nova Scotia incredibly serious and that he is ready to provide any federal support needed. No deaths have been reported, but as images like this continue to fuel worry, officials are urging evacuees to stay away from the impacted area. We'll be back with more world news after this short commercial break. Welcome back. Dozens of protesters clashed with security forces in Senegal's capital, Dakar, after lawmakers and supporters were blocked from visiting the home of a prominent opposition politician on trial for rape and libel. Dozens of protesters clashed with security forces in Senegal's capital on Monday. Police officers fired tear gas at demonstrators who built barricades along one of Dakar's main highways. In one neighborhood, cars and a ministerial building were set on fire. The spark for these clashes was lawmakers and supporters reportedly being blocked from visiting the home of opposition leader Usman Sonko. But it's also the latest round in months of unrest triggered by President Macky Sall's refusal to rule out running for a third term in office and by court cases involving Sonko. The opposition leader is on trial in separate cases for libel and rape. He denies wrongdoing and says the charges are aimed at ruling him out of presidential elections next February. On Sunday, police diverted Sonko to his house after a caravan of vehicles including him and some supporters had planned to enter Dakar. That's ahead of a court judgment in the rape trial expected on June the 1st. According to one opposition MP, political figures were then prevented from visiting Sonko on Monday by police firing tear gas. Senegal's interior minister said Sunday's caravan had not sought permission and was stopped for security reasons. The police and the president's office did not respond to requests for comment on Monday. In the Middle East, the United Nations have stated that operations to savage 1.1 million barrels of oil from a decaying tanker moored off Yemen's coast will soon begin after a technical support ship arrived on the site. Salvage and wreck removal experts arrived on Tuesday to recover 1.1 million barrels of oil from the FSO Safa, a decaying supertanker which the United Nations warns could break up or explode any day. If a spill happens, the UN has warned it could be an environmental disaster, that it could dump four times as much oil into the Red Sea as the 1989 Exxon Valdez disaster off Alaska. The SAFA has been sitting off the coast of Yemen since 1988. However, the country's war caused maintenance operations on board to be suspended since 2015. The UN has contracted the companies Bosculus and Smith to help transfer the oil off the decaying tanker and onto a safe replacement vessel. Crews and experts were seen speaking with Houthi officials on board a technical support ship. UN official in Yemen David Gressley was optimistic about the progress they would make. Yemen has been mired in conflict since the Iran-supported Houthi group ousted the government in 2014. A Saudi-led coalition intervened the year after to aim to restore the government. 
This year, a UN fundraising drive to make the FSO SAFA's salvage operation possible brought in $129 million. But the UN said on its Yemen Twitter account that additional funding is still important to finish the process. The salvage operation can't be paid for by selling the oil on board the tanker because it's unclear who owns it. Top artificial intelligence executives, including OpenAI CEO Sam Altman, join experts and professors in raising the risk of extinction from AI, which they urge policymakers to equate at par with risk posed by pandemics and nuclear war. Brief as it is stark, this one-sentence statement signed by more than 350 tech experts makes a plea to policymakers. It says mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. The Centre for AI Safety points to several disaster scenarios like drug discovery tools being used to create chemical weapons or enfeeblement, where humanity loses the ability to self-govern and becomes completely dependent on machines. Among the statement's backers are executives from Google and Microsoft, the CEO of ChatGPT's OpenAI, and Jeffrey Hinton, referred to as one of the godfathers of AI. For the existential threat, I think maybe the US and China and Europe and Japan can all cooperate on trying to avoid that existential threat. But the question is, how should they do that? And I think stopping development isn't feasible. Other industry figures, however, say the fears around human extinction are overblown, and many believe the real problem with AI is its reproduction of bias learned from racist, patriarchal or exclusionary systems. So I think that these are some of the domains. Hiring and employment is one, credit and lending is another, access to housing access to developmental opportunity like college admissions and school admissions. Uh, these are domains where we really should be paying very close attention. The statement follows a much longer letter signed by more than a thousand experts, including Tesla CEO Elon Musk. It called for a pause in development of next-gen AI, warning non-human minds might eventually outsmart and replace us. France inaugurated a battery-making gigafactory, the first of four such plants European and Asian companies plan to build in the north of the country. France opened a major battery-making gigafactory on Tuesday. It's the first of four such plants European and Asian companies plan to build in the country. Named the Automotive Cells Company, the project is a joint venture between Stellantis, Mercedes and Total Energy and it involves a total investment of $2.2 billion. The French state and local authorities will provide half the funding. French Finance Minister Bruno Le Maire attended Tuesday's opening. Today is a great day for industries in France. Today is a great day for industries in Europe. Depuis Airbus. For the first time since Airbus, France and Europe are creating a new industrial sector, the electric battery sector. The factory shows the race between European governments to attract global car makers. Leading companies want to bring the supply of components for electric vehicles closer to their main markets. Europe currently depends on Asian firms for EV batteries and is competing with the US to attract producers. The new plant will start production of lithium-ion batteries later this year. It aims to have the capacity to fit around half a million cars a year. The companies involved also said the project is expected to help create up to 2,000 jobs by the start of the next decade. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. 
An all-private astronaut team of two Americans and two Saudis, including the first Arab woman, sent into orbit splashed down safely off Florida, capping an eight-day research mission aboard the International Space Station. The Summit of the Union of South American Nations brought together leaders and representatives of the 12-member bloc to Brazilian capital city Brasilia in an effort to prop up regional integration. Presidents from Argentina, Bolivia, Suriname, Uruguay and Venezuela and the Prime Minister of Peru attended the summit chaired by Brazilian President Luiz Inancio Lula Bissell. High inflation, more than offset wage growth in Germany, Europe's largest economy, causing real wages to fall by 2.3% in the first three months. Nominal wages in Germany rose 5.6% year-on-year in the first quarter of 2023, the biggest increase since the start of the time series in 2008. Legislation to hold a referendum to recognize Australia's indigenous people in the constitution cleared its first parliamentary hurdle as it was passed in the House of Representatives. Australians will be asked to vote in a referendum likely to be held between October and December on whether they support altering the constitution to include a voice to parliament. Elon Musk kicked off the second day of his trip to China China leaving his hotel in central Beijing on a Tesla car with blackout windows. Musk was accompanied by Tesla's China-based public affairs chief Grace Tao and head of global manufacturing Tom Zhu. He declined to comment at the hotel when questioned by reporters about the aims of his trip. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest news from around the world. In case you miss any other stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, tonight we end things off in the Peruvian capital of Lima, where Zoo pulled out all its most adorable stops by inviting visitors to meet the zoo's youngest residents. Thank you for watching. Have a great rest of your evening.